Well, good morning, NCC family. It's good to be with you this morning. Again, my name is Micah Hasty. I'm the worship pastor here at the North Canton Chapel. And it's my privilege and honor to be with you in this room to be able to preach this morning. One of my favorite things to do, aside from leading worship musically, is leading worship to the teaching of the word. And so my prayer for us this morning and my prayer for you has been all week that because of this passage today, you would see Jesus rightly and you would respond to him accordingly. And so here's what we're going to do. We're in a series called First Peter. It's the summer series that we're taking all 11 weeks of summer and we're just going through verse by verse, chunk by chunk. And uh, so today we are in chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Uh, And if you're willing and able, let's stand together. We're going to read this passage together. Uh, I'll read it out loud for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on God as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the scriptures, for the ability to open them up and to learn more about what it means to follow you and to trust you. Holy Spirit, would you guide us as we study this together this morning? And Jesus, as I said earlier, it is our prayer that you would help us today to see you rightly and respond accordingly. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So before we unpack verses 13 through 21, we're going to do a little bit of an episode recap if you will, from last week. That's maybe the best way to do it because there's a lot of what was said last week that plays into what Peter says this week. So Pastor Brandon opened up this letter for us last week showing us that it is written to a group of Christians, a group of Christians that are spread throughout the area of Asia and they're in exile. They're far away from home and they needed reminded of the living hope that they had. And we talked about that last week, the living hope that God caused them to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. They needed reminded who they were and to whom they belong. And so if you are a Christian, 1 Peter should be a deeply resonating book for you. It should be a book that you draw encouragement from because in a lot of ways, Peter writes to you. He writes to Christians spread throughout the world. He writes to Gentiles, those who are not born Jewish, but were brought into the family of God through Jesus. And so they are now part of God's chosen people as well. And so you and I, as Christians, we are a part of this. We've been adopted as sons and daughters of God into the family. This is what we learned last week. Yet sometimes we need reminded, don't we? We forget. We forget that we are adopted sons and daughters. We forget who we are and whose we are. One of my favorite movies growing up as a kid was The Lion King. Any Lion King fans out there? Yeah, a couple of you, right? Maybe, yeah, some of you. Yeah, so I used to pull this off VHS on my shelf. And I know that just dates me. So students, VHS, it's like cassette tape because I know those are getting cool again. So VHS tape, it's like YouTube but on a cassette tape. 
Okay? All right, so The Lion King, one of my favorite movies as a kid, and the, anim the new live action one is still animated, just throwing that out there for everybody. Um, but one of my favorite scenes in this movie happens when Simba goes out into the Pride Lands. He's in exile. His Scar has like scared him off. He has run away, and he's met like these two buffoons, uh, Timon and Pumbaa, and he has fully embraced the lifestyle of, anybody know? Hakuna Matata, right? Do whatever you want, no worries, no cares, it's completely good. Simba is away from home and he is in a new culture and he is just doing whatever he wants to do, right? Doing whatever he wants to do. And one of my favorite scenes in the movie happens here whenever Mufasa shows up in this big cloud, right? And he calls to Simba and he says, you need to remember who you are. Some of you can hear James Earl Jones saying that line, can't you? remember who you are. Like there's this very deep resonating thing that as a kid, I was just like, I need to know who I am. Uh, but no, so he calls to him. He says, remember who you are. And what does he tell him? You're my son. You're the future king. You have a place and a purpose. Now I realize this is silly, but a lot of what we learned last week, Peter's saying the same things. Saying, guys, I know you are in different cultures. I know you are spread out far and wide. And everything in the culture is telling you you need to live a certain way. But you need to remember who you are and whose you are. You need to remember the living hope that you have. That God has a plan and a purpose for you. Peter has shown us that we have a living hope in Christ. And that because of this living hope, because we are redeemed, we are now called to live our lives in a certain way. And that's where he's going to go today. But he begins in verses 3 through 13 last week with helping us to see who we are as a result of the living hope that we have. And that's so important. We have to begin with who we are. We have to begin with our relationship with God, that he chose us, that he adopted us as sons and daughters. He is our father. Because if we go into verses 13 through 21, where he says, be holy as God is holy, we're going to start getting things real backwards. Because we're going to believe that how I live can change this relationship with my father. You will believe a false theology that tells you you have to get everything all together in order to be right with God. That's not biblical. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you, get your poop in a group and then come on and follow Jesus. But that's exactly what that theology is. You don't have to get everything all together. In fact, you can't get everything all together. You could not live a perfect, sinless life. If you could, the cross is worthless. If you could live a perfect, holy, sinless life, Jesus has no need to die. But we can't. And it's why we have to start with our relationship with the Father who says, you are my son or my daughter. I have adopted you, you are mine. And from that relationship, from understanding who he is, from understanding the living hope that we have, we can move into this conversation about what it means to be holy as God is holy. The church of Jesus is not made up by our works. It is built on and sustained by God's grace. The grace that he has shown us in the person and work of Jesus. And so again, this is why we begin with the relationship that we have with the Father through Christ the Son. His grace is sufficient for us. The work on his cross cannot be added to or subtracted from. Brandon totally stole my quote last week. He didn't know that I was going to share this this week. Uh, but Jonathan Edwards once said that we have contributed nothing to our salvation except for the sin which made it necessary. And so Peter calls us to this whole, calls us and shows us that holy living is going to stem from this true love and gratitude and appreciation for the person and work of Jesus. When we understand that God the Father gave his son for us, that he became sin for us, 
our mind and our heart enter into holy living in a whole different way because we don't have anything to prove. It's already been proven. So in verses 13 through 21, episode two, if you will, okay, Peter now enters into this conversation and he answers the question for us, so now what? In light of the living hope we have, now what? What do we do? And so in verse 13, Peter begins with our minds. He first tells us to prepare our minds for action. The King James of this verse is awesome. It says to gird up your loins, which for us in this room, we're going, what? Right, like if you, don't, if you read that passage and you're going, what, what does he mean? What am I supposed to do? So for the people of the day, this is actually very, very common language. For us, it is less so. Uh, but I've got a little bit of a comedic graphic here to kind of show you what this looked like. So girding up your loins was battle language. Soldiers used this language. And when a commanding officer would tell his soldiers, gird up your loins for battle, they would grab their longer toga-style garments, pull them up, tie them around their legs, and they would be ready for battle. This was like saying, hey guys, they're coming, get ready. Be prepared. And so they would gird up their loins. Isn't it interesting that Peter uses battle language when he's talking about the mind? He uses language that everyone of the day, they would have understood, wait, soldiers do that. What is he getting at here? Peter uses battle language to encourage us toward deep and critical thinking. It should never be a criticism of Christians that we rely on faith without any critical thinking. The Bible makes sense. It's not a bunch of fantasy and fairy tales. It makes sense. It's historically accurate. It is proven. We don't have to come in here or walk out these doors and check our brains on either side of it. We can think critically as Christians. We should. We've been given gifts by God called the mind, and we should steward them well as acts of worship to our God. But I also believe that Peter here is saying something in the invisibles. He's saying, gird up your loins, prepare your mind for battle. Why does he say this? Because I believe Peter knows what we are experiencing. He knows that the greatest battles that we will ever face will not be battles of flesh and blood, but they will be battles of ideology and philosophy. Do you feel that? I do. We live in a world where absolutes are like, ah, Hey, you know what? That's good for you. You can believe that. If you think it's true, great. But I just feel this way, so I should be able to live this way, right? Prepare your minds for battle. Peter continues. He says that we should be sober-minded, setting our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This word sober-minded here, it means to have a mental awareness, a self-control, a disciplined attention. It is like the most acute focus that you can possibly have. And he's calling us to be acutely focused on what? On the grace that will be brought to us through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this gets a little confusing because we're going, but, but wait, we just talked about Jesus. We've seen his grace last week episode one, in, as our living hope. We get that. So what are we talking about? Peter says that as Christians, you need to be focused, have your, your focus set on the grace of Christ crucified and Christ to come. Christ crucified and Christ to come. But why? Why when we are exiled? Why when we are spread apart? Why when we are in the middle of a culture that is antagonistic toward Christianity? Why should we have our hopes set fully on Christ crucified and Christ to come? Because when we set our hearts to the hope of heaven and to Christ, our earthly home and the hurt of it can be held rightly. Do you understand what I mean? When we set our hearts fully on the hope of heaven into Christ, the hurt of our earthly home can be held rightly. 
Have you felt overwhelmed in recent days? Have you felt the hurt of our earthly home? Have you watched the news and felt overwhelmed or panicked or just sad, broken, concerned for the state of our, our country, of our world, of everything in between? feels like there's a million different things that we can feel these ways about, aren't there? And Christian, if we are not careful and we do not set our focus on Christ crucified and Christ to come, we will quickly become overwhelmed. C.S. Lewis once wrote about this future hope, about this ache that we have. This longing where we're going, Jesus, would you come soon? And sometimes we tack on the back of that just so I don't have to deal with any of it. Anybody else been there? He writes, our lifelong nostalgia, our longing to be reunited with something in the universe from which we now feel cut off. To be on the inside of some door which we have always seen from the outside is no mere neurotic fancy, but it is the truest index of our real situation. And at last to be summoned inside would be both glory and honor beyond all our merits in the healing of that old ache. When Jesus returns and makes all things new. The brokenness of our world will, over, will overwhelm our minds if we do not set our minds fully on the grace of Christ crucified and Christ to come. And so church, remember that when everything feels like it is falling apart, our God is not. He is still in control. Our hope is in him. And he is the one who holds us fast. Peter continues with a challenge in verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. And so Peter is helping us to remember something here. That again, Christians, in our sinful nature, we all have a natural inclination to drive toward passions of the flesh. And we're actually going to unpack passions of the flesh in a couple of weeks as we look at Peter chapter 2. But here, where he opens this conversation up, he says that these are passions of a former ignorance. If someone were to look at you in the face and call you ignorant, would you feel very good about it? No. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The sinful passions and desires we have, the patterns of the world that we once fell into, that we embraced because culture was saying, hey, this is the way we go. At one point in time, we had an excuse for them before Christ. Now, Christian, we no longer do. We no longer do. There are a lot of things that we do as children. It's interesting that Peter uses that phrase, obedient children. There are a lot of things that kids do that are bad for them or dangerous or just gross, right? Like no one has to tell a kid, pick your boogers and eat it. It just happens, right? No one has to tell a child, hey, run as fast as you can across the street without looking. No one has to tell a child, hey, look, there's a big glowing hot thing on top of the stove. I wonder what happens if I touch it. No one has to tell them these things. No one has to tell them to use the restroom all over the place. No one has to tell them these things. Why? Because they don't know any better. As children, they don't know. They need to be taught. They need to be shown that there is a better way to do things, that eating boogers is, in fact, gross, that stoves are hot to, and burning to little hands, but great tools when used rightly. There is a place and a time to use the restroom. They need to be taught these things. Before they were taught, they were living in a former ignorance, but now that they know better, they can live differently. 
Peter's drawing a similar connection. He's saying that Christian, you and I, should not conform ourselves to the old sinful patterns of the flesh. Before we were Christians, before Christ, we did not know better. Now we do. Galatians 5.24 tells us that the passions of sin were nailed to the cross. That Christ died for our sins. And Peter is bringing up the same idea of we are called to be holy. And his sentiment here is similar to what Paul will write in Romans 6, 1 through 2, where he says, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? In other words, when Paul is writing, he's got a group of Christians that are going, hey, Paul, we understand Jesus. We get the forgiveness and grace thing. Like Jesus died for our sins, we're forgiven, that's awesome. So let's just go live however we want. Can't we just keep doing this sinful stuff? Isn't that okay? Because we're forgiven, right? God's grace is, is enough for us. Shouldn't we do that? And Paul writes, surely not. Surely not. Other translations translate it in my favorite way. They say, God forbid. It feels stronger, doesn't it? Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. And so if, again, we begin with this relationship with God as our father, our living hope. If God is our father, then as children obey a father that they respect and love, we should obey our father and no longer live according to the patterns of the world and the passions of the flesh. Because, verse 15, as God who called you is holy, you also Be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Here, Peter is quoting some Old Testament law from Leviticus 11.44, where God tells the people to be holy as he is holy. Holy means set apart for a purpose. Set apart for a purpose. Peter is showing us that as followers of Christ, we should exemplify nonconformity to fallen humanity. He's saying, hey, Christian, living in a culture that thinks following Jesus is ridiculous, you should look different than the world. You should look different. God set you apart for a purpose. But this is the problem in our modern age. Often, we look at culture, and we allow culture to influence our view of Christ, rather than allowing Christ to influence our view of culture. We look around us and we say, hey, this Jesus stuff, did he really mean that? I mean, surely not that, like not that much, right? Like that's weird, my friends are going to look at me strange. My coworkers won't jive with that. If I say that at the parent teacher meeting, they're going to think I am a nutball. Like, absolutely crazy. Do you really mean that? There are many things that our culture say are good and right that scripture tells us is sin and wrong. The question for the Christians then and the question for us now is to decide, will we actually look different? Will we be set apart, holy as he is holy? Because we must remember that as God's children, okay, carrying forward from last week, if God is our father and we are his children, we are not our own. I think for most of us, we have either been on the receiving end of a conversation like this or we've been the one leading the way. Uh, there are some times when maybe a son or daughter will walk into the room with their parent and they will say something like this. Mom, why can't I watch this movie? Everyone at school was talking about it today. Like they, they were giving stuff away and I haven't been able to see it yet. Wh- Come on, I know we talked about this, but why can't I watch it? Mom, why can't I wear this to school? Everybody else is. Dad, I don't understand. Why can't I have a phone and social media access? It's unrestricted 24-7. Everyone else does, I'm going to miss out. And the way that we answer those reveals our convictions about those things. But if you were like me in my household, those conversations often ended with something like this. Micah, you know, dad always said my name very slowly at the beginning of this. 
He would say, Micah, your friend's parents are responsible for them. What they do and how they live, that is their choice. But I am accountable to God for you. And as you live under my, dad's words, as you live under my house with my rules, this is how we live. Anyone ever been on that conversation? Probably all of us to some degree, right? We must remember that if God is our father, he is less concerned about what everyone else is doing. If God is our father, he is less concerned with what everyone else is doing. But as his child, he is very concerned with what you are doing, how you are living. R.C. Sproul once wrote about this tension. He said, the hardest thing in the Christian life is to remember to whom we belong and what it means to say Jesus is Lord. This is different than Jesus is Savior. This is different than Jesus has saved me from my sins. When we say Jesus is Lord, that means that everything that we are is submitted to his authority. And if we're honest, less of us like Jesus as Lord than we do as Savior. I would argue that only one of those really matters more. Sproul continues, Christians ought to be motivated to holiness by the desire and opportunity to reflect God's character. The opportunity. Peter points to this very thing in verse 17 where he says, And if you call on God as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Again, Peter emphasizes this relationship with God as our Father, and he shows us that God is the one who judges our conduct he is the standard by which we know if we are living holy lives or not. He is the one who decides what is sinful and not sinful, what is right and wrong, holy and unholy. We don't have that authority. Only he does. Peter doesn't hop in here and say, hey, I'm the one. I've been watching how you guys are living. And No, that's not what he does. Our father the one who is our living hope, the one who sent Jesus on our behalf. He is the one who sets the standard for us, not us. But Peter has an interesting phrase in there. He says, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of the exile. What is he talking about here? This word fear is a word meaning reverence or respect or awe, but this specific use of the word carries with it something different. It carries with it this idea of not wanting to offend, disappoint, or misrepresent. Now, I know not everyone in this room, as I'm talking about God as Father and that relationship with there, I realize that for some of you, that might be a hurtful thing to hear because your relationship with your Father was not good. Um, can I just say something to you when I'm talking about God as Father? It doesn't matter if you had an incredible relationship with your dad and he was like dad of the year every year, or if you never knew your dad, both of them pale in comparison to the love of a father that will never fail you. He will never break his promise. He will always show up. And so we can rest in him. But when I think about this relationship with God and this idea of not wanting to offend, disappoint, or misrepresent, um, it actually takes me back to conversations that I have with my siblings. Uh, so I've got a brother and a sister who are 20 and 19 years older than me. And we always, I don't know why we do this, but every time we get together, the conversation comes up of how we used to get in trouble when we were kids. Anybody else? That's the thing that you talk about? I don't know why. We just enjoy the punishment, I guess. Um, but we walk back through these things and we talk about the difference of getting in trouble and mom finding out versus dad finding out. Right? And there's always a tension here. So and what's interesting is that even though there's a large age gap between us, our response is still the same. If we got in trouble and mom found out, the answer was run as fast as you can. Because mom had this huge wooden spoon. I almost brought it in, but I couldn't figure out a place to hide it. 
Um, and it's, a, it's about this tall. It's got a, a big cup type bowl on there that's good for um, smacking the backside. And so, but the, the thing was, it was this, like if mom, if mom found out you were in trouble and she was furious, she would grab that thing and just swing it at whatever you were running by with. And, and this was it. This was it. And sometimes I'm, re- I'm really thankful for that because there are some moments where stuff would come out of my mouth to my mom and I deeply needed to know in that moment very quickly, you done messed up. And uh, I needed to not do that again. And so we would all laugh about this. And then there was this different conversation that would happen if dad found out. If dad found out, we would often end up here, sitting on the stairs of our back deck, and dad would just talk to you. First time it happened, it was super weird. I had no idea what was coming. Because ha- I'm just expecting, like dad's 30 years in the army, I'm waiting for him to just absolutely lose everything. But he was just, so what were you thinking? What did you hope the outcome would be? Did you consider how this might affect you or your friends or your mom and I? And there was this, and he never talked down to us. It was never this moment of like, you're an idiot. It was nothing like that. And we all knew we had disappointed dad. And we all agree that we would rather take the back of a furious wooden spoon than disappointing dad. Why? Because we knew dad loved us. And we knew that when we had disappointed dad, all bets were off. Like it was, it was just the worst. We'd misrepresented him in some way. As Christians, we are called to live holy lives. To conduct ourselves in a way that represents our father well. We do this because of our deep love and gratitude for Christ, and we don't want to misrepresent him. Peter reminds us in verses 18 and 19 that we were ransomed from our old sinful ways that our fathers fell into. He says, you were bought with a price, and the price was not silver or gold things that we would consider precious metals, but you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. Isn't it interesting here that just like today, back then, silver and gold were considered Precious metals, that's what they were called. But Peter reserves that word, precious, in this verse for only one thing. For the blood of Jesus. Silver and gold, no. Let me tell you what's really precious. What really matters. He says that the precious blood of Christ was like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. It was perfect. It was exactly what was needed. And then in verses 20 and 21, he says that Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. You who through Jesus are believers in God. God, who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith, so that our faith and hope may be in God. Peter reminds us Jesus is eternal. He has always been, and he has always had a clear plan and purpose. And that purpose is that we might believe, that we might have the ability to have this relationship with our Father, that we may have the ability to place our hope in God. Commenting on why we are to live holy lives, R.C. Sproul remarked that the grace of God that has been shown to us in our salvation, in our justification, it cannot be changed or torn apart ever. In other words, this relationship that we have with God can never change. As our father, he never quits being our father. Why does he say this? Remarking on this passage. Because just like we said earlier, if I begin with holy living, I can start believing that if I mess up enough, Jesus won't love me anymore. If I sin bad enough, I must not be a Christian If if it all falls apart, if I just ruin the whole thing, 
God's just going to kick me out of heaven. It is false theology. It is not true. God will never stop being our father. We are his adopted sons and daughters. But, obviously, holy living matters, or we wouldn't be talking about it, would we? R.C. Sproul would continue in his thought, and he would say, while nothing can change our relationship with God, the way that we live in our lives, it can alter how we relate to him. Let me show you what I mean. So these are my daughters, the cute three in the middle. There's the creepy guy on the right. We don't talk about him. And then my wife, Kristen, on the left. Um, they will never quit being my daughters. Ever. I'm their dad. There's nothing they can do to change that. They didn't choose me as their father. And they will never stop being my kids. but the way that they behave in my home may change how they relate to me as a father. If they break the rules of our house, then they relate to me as disciplinarian. If we sit down at the breakfast table and we open up our schoolwork and start looking at it, they relate to me as an educator. If we're wrestling and playing in the backyard, they relate to me as a friend. If one of them falls and skins their knee, they may relate to me as a helper. Or if in the middle of the night there's a bad dream and lots of tears, they relate to me as a comforter or a protector. In all of those scenarios, I never stop being father. The relationship with me never changes, but how they relate to me does. The way that you conduct yourself as a son or daughter of a king, never changes the fact that you are God's child, that he loves you, that his love is unfailing. There is nothing you can do to cause God to love you more or less. He loves you perfectly. But the way in which you conduct yourself may change the way that you relate to your father. The psalmist writes of a good shepherd who guides and protects in his love with his staff, and then he also disciplines with the rod, both equal acts of love. Our relationship with God as Father matters to how we understand what it means to live holy lives, and how we live our lives communicates to a watching world what we really believe about our Father. So what does how you live your life communicate to a watching world? What does it communicate about what you believe about this precious blood of Jesus? Blood that saves us, makes us new. What does it say about your belief that God is your father, that he has adopted you as a son or a daughter and that he is good and faithful and never breaks his promises? I had a youth pastor who used to always give this silly illustration, and I used to laugh about it, but he's pretty dead on. He says, you know, there are, there are five Gospels. And as a middle schooler, I would look at him and go, you wrong. He said, no, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And most people only read you. Be holy as I am holy is not a legalistic list of do's and don'ts. It is because of the living hope that we have, because of the work of Jesus on our behalf, because of what he has done, we will gladly live our lives fully in devotion and worship to a God who has given everything for us because we love him and we wouldn't dare want to misrepresent him to a watching world. Why? Because he is so good, we just want everyone to know about it. Our very lives should point to the fact that we are adopted sons and daughters. So here's what we're gonna do in these closing moments. The band is gonna come and they're gonna lead us in a time of prayer and reflection. They're gonna sing a hymn over us called He Will Hold Me Fast. 
And it's a hymn that talks about this incredible love of our God that even when we mess up, even when we don't get any of the holy living thing right, God's love is still sufficient. His grace is still good. And so here's what I would like you to do in these moments. We're not going to stand and sing. I'd like us to sit and pray. Because this is what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to leave this room and think, man, if I've been misrepresenting God so much, like I'm just worthless. That's a lie from the enemy. And we just will pray against that. If you were an adopted son or daughter of God, he loves you and there's nothing you can do to change it. You can kick and scream, be like, no. He goes, I don't care, I love you, sorry. but we're going to pray. And some of you, as we pray, as the band leads us, you may just need to put your hands up and just thank God for that relationship. Thank him for his goodness and for his grace and for his love. Others, maybe you do need to pray and say, God, I I have misrepresented you. There are ways in which I have messed this thing up. Would you help me? And he will. Some of you need to pray for the first time to begin that relationship with Jesus and say, Jesus, would you be the forgiver of my sin and the Lord of my life? Families in the room, husbands and wives, you may need to grab hands and pray for marriages that represent the love of Jesus for his church. Or families, you may need to wrap your arms around your family and commit as Joshua did in Joshua 24. He says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Doesn't matter what all the rest of you guys are doing, we're going after Jesus. Do we really make much of Jesus every day to everyone? That's the question, isn't it? We have a loving Father who holds us fast. So I'm going to pray to begin our time, and the team is going to lead us. And as they sing, pray. And I'll be back up in a few moments to close us out. Father, we love you. Help us to rest in your grace and give us the courage to move forward in ways that we cannot on our own. We want to represent you well because you have loved us so much. It is in your name we pray.